so uh, today's topic, we are one, uh, one body in Christ. We have uh, been looking our way through uh, the gospel, uh, through the book of Romans, and uh, today we're on, a th on the verse where Paul says, we are one body in Christ. We're going to start in Romans chapter 12, verse 4. In bo one body, we have many members. So the human body has lots of different uh, parts to it, and each part has a different function. And Paul's about to say that this group, this body that we're part of, we're part of the body of Christ, we all have different functions. So you have different things that you're good at compared to the person next to you. The person next to you has some skills you don't have. You might be jealous of them. You might uh, not want anything to do with those skills. Uh, but they have different things than you. And one of the ways that the body of Christ gets confused is to think that everybody should be the same. Uh, it is true that there are many aspects of our mission that we're all called to do some, some core things where everybody gets to do one job uh, that, for instance, telling others the good news about the kingdom of heaven is near. That's something we all get to do. But there are some people here who are really good at it. That's the best thing that they do. It's where they shine. Uh, and for some of them, it's when they speak to a large group. For some people, it's when they speak one-on-one. -on -one. But that's their gift and their interest. There are other people that that's part of your job description. You do it, but you're not great at it. There are other things that you're great at. And uh, so it's like that in the body. The eyes have a particular function. If the eyes convince the liver, the liver, you've got a messy job. You really shouldn't be doing such gross stuff. You should be more eye-like. You should be seeing and perceiving and recognizing. If the liver finally decides that they're right, the liver's job is just too messy. It really isn't that great to talk about in polite company what the liver does. There's just, so maybe the liver will take a holiday and go to an eye convention and try to become more like an eye and start seeing and perceiving and recognizing things. Well, what will happen to the body? Within a short amount of time, the body will discover the liver had a really important job. It was crucial, and it was not to see, and not to perceive, and quite frankly, not the way the eyes do, not to know. The liver has a very dif different function, and it is essential, just like your function is essential. We all, in this one body of Christ, have lots of different things that we do. and. And for many of us, we are gifted by God in some special area. And if you drop out because uh, you get discouraged, there's an absence that nobody else can fill. And the body can get by without an eye or an ear or a hand. Uh, but it's less, right? It's, uh, it's not as optimum as when all the members of the body are contributing to the mission of Christ. Paul writes, we have one body, many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy, and he's going to list some gifts. This is not a complete list but it's a list of some of the things that people might do. Prophecy is encouraging people, building up and consoling. So some people are really good at letting others know, wow, you're really gifted at that. Maybe that's something you should practice more because you seem to be really skilled at that. Uh, so prophecy lets people know uh, what the, it encourages, builds up and consoles. Ministry, uh, going alongside someone and helping them out, uh, teaching, telling people what, helping people recognize what the truth is. Exhortation, 
uh, for people who haven't listened to the teachers. Maybe they need someone to come along and exhort them to what the truth is. Uh, people who are generous, people who are able to lead others and organize and to get uh, the whole body marching in the same godly direction, uh, people who have the gift of compassion. There's lots of other gifts that people have, but these are some of them uh, that Paul mentions and that some of you may be majoring in. When you have a gift, it's good for you to get practice. And the way that uh, practice works best is if you practice at the edge of where you're incompetent. So many people like to practice on things that they're great at. So you get out a jigsaw puzzle and you do not do the kind of puzzles that Jeannie does. You get out one that has five pieces. And uh, when you've got it done, you start over because you know you can do it. But that won't help you develop your skill set. What, what's best for, uh, for your gifting is to go to the edge where you're not comfortable and where you're just slightly incompetent and to practice that. And as you begin to explore the edges of your gift, you will be able to expand and get better and get better. And uh, it's good when tennis stars do this. It's far more helpful when Christians do this. Uh, because the things that you do will have a lifelong eternal consequence. Matthew 25, the other verse we're going to look at today. Uh, Jesus tells a story. We're not going to look at the whole story. We're going to look at a slice of it, but it will probably help us get the point of the whole story. Jesus says, if you want to think about the kingdom of God, I, I'll, I'll tell it to you this way. It's like there was a man who was going to go on a journey and he summoned his slaves. So Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to someone who owns property and slaves and decides to leave. To one he gave five talents. Now is this, I'm guessing, had zero emotional reaction when you heard that. But in Jesus' day, a talent wasn't something like being able to twirl something on, you know, twirl a basketball or do so. That wasn't a talent. In Jesus' day, a talent was a bag of money and not a small bag. It was a jaw-dropping bag of money. So when Jesus said that he gave one five talents, the reaction of the crowd in his day would have been, oh, that much? Yeah, that much. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. And there's probably some people who, as they look at this, would say, well, that's so unfair. We should all be equal. Faith Lutheran should have as many members as we do, or the other way around. Uh, but no, uh, God is extraordinarily strategic. God, Jesus is telling a story about God, right? The kingdom of heaven and how, how it works. God gives to some people an enormous quantity of gifting, a jaw-dropping amount of gifting, and to some others, still a lot of gifting, but not as much as, as to the one who got so much. To each, Jesus says, according to their ability. There are times when a person, what they can handle is a small amount. And they're good at managing a small amount, and for them to get more wouldn't make so much sense. But what they've got, they're to manage it well. Whether you have a lot or a little, each according to your ability, manage it well. Then he went away. So that's where we're going to end the story, and it's kind of an uncomfortable ending because uh, who wants God to go away in their life, right? Jesus telling a story about the kingdom of heaven, and one thing you know about metaphors is that they, they only go so far. There are times when uh, you, if you push them past the, what they're useful for, you can develop some theories that are just whacked, really not true. Um, but in our life, what we should 
expect is that God gives you a tremendous amount of gifting and then lets you do what you will. If you decide to ask for coaching and advice, God will probably help you with some coaching and advice. But for the most part, it's up to you. Britney Spears, how will you use your talents? Insert your name into that same question. How will you use your talents and abilities? Uh, God's available for coaching, but, but is really not in the, in the business of dictating what you do with what God has so generously given you. But what God will do is see at the end, what have you done? Because God is very interested in, uh, in what you've done. Loves seeing what you're doing now. Is really interested at the end to see what you've done uh, given not just the days you've had so far, but the days you get to have to come. Everybody has a different gift. We're counting on you, whatever your gift is. If you think, oh, I don't know what my gift is, ask five people who know you well, what am I really good at that blesses people? So not, our, not what are you really good at, because you might be particularly good at a particular video game that's just pleasure for you, but not helping anybody else. Not saying, don't, not saying stop that, I'm just saying that's not your gift. Uh, designing a game like that might be a gift, uh, but wh what, are you, what are your gifts? We're counting on you. And God, who sometimes may seem like God has wandered away, leaving you all on your own, God is counting on you too, to use the things that God has so generously given you in a way that benefits the body of Christ and all the world as a result. We're going to take a moment for prayer. God, thanks for the chance to hear your word in the Bible, in uh, it being preached, in dramas, in song, and in so many ways that you can help inspire us by the power of your spirit to hear uh, what the universe is proclaiming on a day-to-day -day basis of how much you have given us, us, how much you love us, and how much you're counting on us to help do the job to help people who do not yet know of your great love. Thank you for your mercy. We praise you. Amen.